All right, so the plan today is, uh, especially since I'm teaching for a company called Christian Brothers, that I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer before we start. Uh, first thing, though, would be I'd like to share a verse, and that's Proverbs twenty two twenty nine says, Do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. So my mom always quoted that verse to me, and I really like that. I wanted to share that with you guys. If you would uh, entertain me in this, I want to say a quick prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity that we have today to be together. Help me to speak clearly in a way that my audience will understand. Help those listening to focus on the material and to be able to apply what is learned here today directly in the shop tomorrow. Amen. Hey guys, my name is Paul Danner, um, a.k.a. Scanner Danner. And for those of you that don't know, um, I have a YouTube channel by that name and also a website, ScannerDanner.com, where I offer online training for uh, technicians in the field. Uh, my purpose here today is to teach you guys circuit identification and integrity. We have an hour and 15 minutes, so let's just jump right in. No reason to... Uh, make this intro longer than it needs to be. Purpose, I have listed here four things. To quickly and accurately verify sensor wiring for opens and shorts. To be able to identify the circuit design and circuit wiring without a wiring diagram or service information. To bypass an engineer written flowchart that was never designed for speed. We all know that test. Disconnect the computer, disconnect the sensor, measure the wiring for opens and shorts. And, you know, you're 45 minutes into the job before you've gotten through step one. Why? Because the computer lives underneath the wiper cow and you have to take the wipers off and the wiper cow off. And, you know, just to dig it out of there to be able to do that test to unplug it, they're not written for speed. Uh, and then number four, to prevent the need to access the computer. <laughs> Did you get him? <laughs> I'm cooking him now. Oh, oh he's smoking. Oh, your friend. Oh, there's more. Oh, I got another one. There was two more. Did you see them all come over? They were looking for their friend who was dying. One more. One more. I saw you. Come back. Okay. Um. Next slide, just uh, starting with some preliminary stuff as we're going to be talking about pressure sensors and uh, thermistor, sorry, pressure sensors and potentiometers. Primarily, I want to talk about a bias voltage that is on some of these sensors. So just very quickly, uh, operation of a three wire potentiometer. Um, we're dealing with a five volt reference circuit that will feed out to the sensor that looks so good. on its way to ground. And we're talking about a voltage drop of five, four, three, two, one. And then right here would be your throttle shaft. And this piece actually moves, right? This wiper would move. And we'd feed the signal back to the computer this way. Um, moving forward, this part's important. Um, our voltage sensing circuit I have drawn here, very generic. Just think of this as your voltmeter. And this is your voltmeter positive lead. And this is your voltmeter negative lead. Um, what you want to remember about this is it does not support current flow, okay? It doesn't support current flow. We're just watching what's going on here. As far as the data goes from there, the in input from there would be transferred to another chip, whatever. And then eventually when your scan tool is connected and you see TPS volts, well, that's where it's coming from, all right? Uh, next page. We have something here that um, a lot of service information doesn't give us information on. And um, you can see it in the bottom picture, there is a resistor that is attached between the reference, this is our five volt ref, and our signal, this being our signal wire, there is a resistor that's attached internal to the computer. Um, how does that play in uh, in a working circuit? The answer is it doesn't. You, you'll never see it. You would never know that it's there in a working circuit. Um, that resistor is very high ohms and it essentially uh, bleeds off 
through the potentiometer itself to ground. You would never see it. So if I compare two different potentiometers, one without the resistor and one with the resistor, kind of like what I'm doing here, um, I'm, I'm trying to illustrate that they're both the same, 0.45. And I realize the wiper isn't in a 0.45 volt position. That would be more like down in that area here. But I, I just pulled a generic picture in for that. It wasn't about the position of the wiper. It was just about illustrating. You wouldn't even know that that resistor's there. When will you know it's there? Next page, unplug it. We unplug that sensor and now we see it. So what's going on here? Pretty clear in the top picture that, you know, sensor unplugged, we read five, zero, and zero, right? That sensing circuit, it's just a voltmeter. Think of that as your positive and negative lead. Same thing down here, voltmeter, positive lead, negative lead. The bottom picture though, what you're looking at is that five volts actually um, would extend to the sensor, of course. And then as it always has been, it's running through this resistor, but there's no ground through the sensing circuit. Um, as you're gonna see moving forward, we're somewhere in the range of 30,000 to 500,000 ohms on that sensing circuit. It's not a, a, something that's gonna carry um, any current flow. And so what happens then if we unplug the sensor is we've taken, we've taken that ground, oops, sorry about that. It's a little bit weird using this ink tool here. Um, we've taken the ground away for the resistor, which was where? Through the potentiometer itself. And it wouldn't matter what position that's in, um, that you're still essentially grounding that resistor. So you take its ground away, what happens? You're gonna see five. Some of you are thinking, well, won't you have a drop across a resistor? And the answer is yes. But what do we need to have a drop across a resistor? Well, we need to have current flow. Take the ground away and you have five. So we're gonna use this to our advantage moving forward. Any questions so far? Good? Okay. All right, so first thing I wanna talk with you guys about, um, just, just to illustrate this in use and how it applies, is a 2014 uh, Volkswagen Jetta. This, this car, this is from my friend Tommy Wolf of Positive Lead Diagnostics. Him and I work together on, on occasion on some videos and he's done some uh, some videos for me for my premium channel. And that's where you'll find this case study is actually on the premium channel. And I pulled these slides off of it this morning. Um, and so he had a boost pressure sensor fault on this Volkswagen. And uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna see how this five volt bias on the circuit applies to this fault. So step one, um, we have scan data, right? Have a trouble code, what's the next step? No reason to open the hood yet. Let's look at the scan tool and uh, look at our data. And so we're seeing a signal voltage of 4.995 right there. And I just wrote 4.9 volts. So it's fixed all the time. In the video, you can see him snapping the throttle looking for a reaction. And we are getting some reaction of these sensors up here uh, or these inputs up here um, I'm not going to talk about that right now, given our time. I just want you guys to know that this is uh, substituted values that are going on because of a recognized hard fault. And so if you want more info on substituted values, guys, I have that in my uh, premium channel too. And I apologize. I'm not here to just plug the premium channel. Um, I just want you guys to know that that info is there. If you have an interest in substituted values, I have a whole class on that too that Caleb and I recently did. It was excellent. Um, uh, it was one of our newer ones. So make sure you look there. But that's what's going on there. Next picture. Let's confirm, right? Scan tools reading five volts. We're fixed at five. Well, I guess I could ask you guys a question. It's what type of problem are we dealing with? And <laughs> I got a fly that's... So I mentioned this before I started. Uh, if you see me... Uh, swatting at things with this electronic ratchet. Um, we're about to cook a, a fly live on camera. I've killed like six of them already. They've been landing on the lens, landing on my face. So if you see it, I got to do it. It could be fun. Nice breakup in what we're doing. But well, there's one more, Caleb. I missed them. So five volts on the scan tool. Um, next step, let's go down to the sensor and measure it. This is kind of weird. I, it's not a great picture. It's a picture of Tommy, but it's a picture of the voltmeter. He's connected directly to the sensor. 
I'm, I apologize. I asked a question and I was interrupted by the fly. My question was, we have five volts on the scan tool. What we're looking at right in our minds right away, we should be thinking open circuit, open circuit. You got five volts on the scan tool. Now that you know that that bias voltage is there, you want to be thinking open circuit. So next step, Tommy's at the sensor. He's measuring it. We're reading 1.57 volts measured at the sensor, yet we're reading five volts at the computer. And the next step that he did in the video is he unplugged the sensor. And what we should have at the sensor is five volts because that bias is there. We know it's there looking at the scan tool. This is the hard part about this kind of training is I know that there's questions here and I'd love to be able to answer them. Yeah. Cook. Wait, let's get it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was awesome. I should have had it full screen for that. I did. Said good nice <laughs> All right. Um, Five volts at the computer, 1.5 volts at the sensor. We have an open, okay? So next step is exactly that. Let's go to the computer, take a measurement. So here's Tommy like listing the voltage he had of 1.5 and then he's going up to the computer now on pin, uh, pin T91, whatever, not important. Next page, this is the computer measurement. We're reading 5.7 volts. That's awfully high for a reference circuit. Uh, must be normal on this Volkswagen. It's 2014. It's not a car that I see a lot of. Uh, in any case, we'll just call that five volts. It's our bias voltage. It is there. It's at the computer. So we absolutely have a problem from the computer to the sensor. Um, we have an open. Let's go find it. Before we do, let me ask you a quick question. What would you do if you measured 1.5 at the sensor and then you come up to the computer and read 1.5 at the computer, yet the scan tool is still reading 5 volts. Where would our problem be? What do you guys think? There's two that I can so think of. ECM, broken wire, ECM, PCM, connector, uh, main computer, logic issue. Yep. Yeah, cool. So uh, open wire wouldn't be there in this case, but a pin fitament would be. So a pin contact issue right there at the computer or the computer itself. So very good. You guys had said that. Um, if you're reading uh, uh, like what we are right here, a 5 volt signal at the computer and a 1.5 volt signal at the sensor, that's where our open is. And that's what we have here. Look at the next page. Um, we're going to find the open. This is all in the video. Um, he's tugging on the connector because we know connectors typically um, we'll have problems in that area. That wasn't where we were. Um, then he started doing some visual inspections. It's the blue wire that is open. And here's another shot of it once he opened the harness up. So this is a, uh, classic open circuit fault. And then we're using bias voltage as a guide, knowing that that should be there, right? That 1.5 volts at the sensor while the scan tool is reading five confusing. So let's look at that again. Now that it's fixed, let's go to the sensor. And I know, I know we don't see that hook up here, but he's measuring now at the sensor unplugged. What do we see? 5.7 volts. So if you did that, let's, let's reverse the situation. We're reading a fault code for the sensor and we're reading five volts on the computer. You come down to the sensor and you read five volts. How's your signal wire? How's your signal wire? It's fine. Next step would be check your sensor ground, make sure that's good. Take a quick peek at the reference too. You're done, put a sensor in it. Yes. And it says, why would you get 1.5 volts if the wire is broken? Ah, it's a great question. That, that was my question well, earlier. I'm glad, so Caleb um, uh, is just read the question to me, is why are we getting 1.5 volts if the wire's broken? Okay, number one, remember this. The signal circuit, the signal voltage sensing circuit in the computer is just watching. That's all it's doing. It's not part of the process. It's not part of the normal circuit flow. Um, that was exactly that question I'm addressing in this next slide. So before I pulled in the image, before, what are we reading? 1.57 volts with an open in the wire. 
What are we reading after? 1.57 volts. I realized Tommy was on a different voltage scale, so we see the extra decimal point. It would have been nice to have the same scaling here, but notice with a good wire intact and a bad wire open, we have the exact same voltage output from the sensor itself. And here's why. Let, let, me, let me pull in this drawing real quick. And we'll clear the ink. And I know that this is not a pressure sensor. This is a drawing more along the lines of a potentiometer. But this is just how you want to think about it. This is how they work. And so what we had in this case study is an open in that wire right there. Remember the normal path of current is from the 5 volt ref through the resistor and to ground. And our drop occurs because we have current flow. It's not measurable. It's in the microamps, but it's still there. And so this 5 volt that drops down to 0 volts is occurring all the time. It doesn't matter that the signal wire is open. If I could take my voltmeter, uh, and I've done this before to experiment with this as I'm, I'm explaining this to students. Take this signal wire and cut it, and then go with your voltmeter on this side, right, this side of the brake, and move the wiper in different positions, you'll read one volt when it's down here, and you'll read four volts when it's up there. So it will still function. And that's the answer to that question. Does that make sense to you, Caleb? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, any follow-up to that? Please feel free to post that. Great question. Um, and that really emphasizes, again, that the sensing circuit in here is not really part of making having a sensor produce proper voltage. Not in this application. There are other applications where, um, like a Hall effect with a pull down type signal, and that's a little bit different than what we're talking about here. But, but for pressure sensors, potentiometers, yeah, great question, great question. All right. So, and that's exactly why I pulled that image up. I wanted to show that we had the exact same signal voltage before and after. And that, again, emphasizes my beginning point. That internal resistor has no effect on the signal circuit when it's plugged in. Okay? Um, and then this is scan data. When we were done, uh, we can see that on the scan tool that we have a 1.57 volt. Everybody's happy, right? Customer's happy. You're happy. Your boss is happy because you did this job and you did it properly and you weren't a parts changer, right? Don't be a parts changer and don't read a fault code and change a part. It doesn't work like that. Sure, sometimes we can get away with changing a part um, based on a code, but you should do some simple checks and knowing this bias voltage, knowing it's there, this is going to be key uh, moving forward. And, and actually, as we continue here, I'm going to teach you ways to do this when there isn't a bias voltage too. And so that's coming up. Okay. And so this is just a review now of chapter 10 that I have in my text from before. I pulled a couple of slides in here, circuit integrity. And in these two slides, um, what I talk about is using a resistor and jumping the 5 volt reference to the signal wire and then jumping the signal wire to ground. And, and, and um, looking at trouble codes, like if it's setting a high code, we'll force a low code. If it's setting a low code, let's force a high code. We would do that whenever we don't have a data parameter available. So think about that. There are, there are components that sometimes uh, our aftermarket scan tools won't give us that particular uh, piece of information. That data PID's not there. And you want to do some wiring checks and you have, say, a circuit high code well, then just manipulate the circuit and make it low and then reread the codes. And that tells you what, if we set the opposite code after, say, you jump the signal to ground, what's it tell you about your wiring integrity? That it's good. And so what do we not have to do? We don't have to follow. Now, let me be clear. We do want to follow the manufacturer flowcharts as a guide. They are our guide. But we don't have to follow them how they want us to do it. We learn the circuit and we do it ourselves and then we can quickly be able to say, I don't need to dig that computer out and do this measurement because it's good because when I do this test, I can make the code change. And so that's what this talks about. And this page would be one where we're doing the same thing, but we're using data parameters um, to give us that guide. Now, I want to warn you of something here on this. 
and we're going to see it here in a minute, that some data PIDs will not change with the engine off and just the key on. You have to have an RPM signal. And guess what? The map sensor is one of them. You can sit there and manipulate a map sensor circuit all you want. Make the signal voltage change. Scan data will, will stay the same and it won't move. And it will really throw you for a loop if you're not aware of that. So I have that note in here. You want to make sure um, that when you're doing this, here's that note right there you want to pay attention to. Engine may need to be started or at least attempted to start. Crank it over. Get an RPM signal for data pit updates. Remember that when you're doing circuit integrity testing. Okay? Uh, same picture there where uh, we we're using the resistor and jumping things. And so in my text, I talked about using a, using a 5,000 ohm resistor. And when I originally wrote this and I was jumping the reference to the signal and jumping the signal to ground, again, for high circuit problems, low circuit problems, trying to force it to change, I used to just use a jumper wire. And uh, this is where I had a um, subscriber years and years and years ago say, hey, well, what if the signal circuit shorted to ground? And I never really thought about that. I was like, that's a great question. Like if I had a, let's say I had this, I'll just do this one quick. We said we weren't going to do this given time, but if this was plugged in and let's say that this signal circuit shorted to ground, we're going to have on the scan tool a zero volt signal all the time. And so the test would be that I'm telling you to do is disconnect the component and jump the reference to ground. And then what you're trying to do is you're driving that signal high. We want to see that jump to five. And if it does, how's the integrity of your wiring? You're good. I don't need to dig the computer out and do a resistance measurement. It's good. But the variable is, what if the signal wire is shorted to ground? And so I added, thank you, whoever that was probably seven or eight years ago uh, said that. And, and so I, I was like, that's a great point. And so I added, hey, if we're going to do this test, let's do it with a resistor just in case the signal wire is shorted to ground A or B. What if we accidentally jump the reference to ground by accident that's easy to do it's not in order sometimes they're right next to each other on the pins and you're trying to do an integrity test what happens if you jump the five volt reference to the sensor ground wire is you're going to pull that whole regulator voltage down and potentially hurt the five volt regulator in the computer now i will add what i see on five volt regulators is they're highly protected so they, a short will occur, yeah, the car shuts off and everything stops working, but as soon as you take the short away, everything comes back. But I have seen them damaged, and I'm not suggesting that you ever intentionally ground a 5-volt reference circuit, okay? Just don't do it. What does the resistor act as for us? It acts as a buffer, okay? And that's really the origins, and I wish I had more time. Um, that's the origins of this class is, are there other ways to do this? And then what if there isn't? a bias what can we use to do signal circuit integrity testing and, and they have sensor simulators and things like that that you can buy and i i have them too i had some sent to me but i never use them because i've developed other ways to do it with the tools that i have uh, including my body being one of the resistors i'll use my body you're going to see here so let's keep going all right next step next uh next slide meter impedance why is this important uh, you're going to see. Um, in this slide, uh, I want to move past this quickly. What I'm doing, uh, you guys have heard the terms before, a high impedance meter. Use a high impedance meter when you're testing circuits. And we want to do that for sensor circuits because um, they're low voltage and we don't want to steal voltage from the circuits we're trying to test. Okay. And so what I'm showing you guys is just very quickly... Um, my red meter is set to DC volts and I'm measuring the resistance um, of my red meter with my yellow meter. And that's showing me a basically 7 million ohms of resistance. My voltmeter between the two leads, between the positive and negative lead of this meter is the equivalent. It's the equivalent of 7 M ohms. Okay. Um, on the next one. Same thing, except I switched my meter. Now I'm measuring, darn it. I'm measuring the voltage output of my yellow meter and uh, I am measuring the, re sorry, I said that wrong. I'm measuring the resistance of my yellow meter in the voltage scale and the 
uh, equivalent here between these two leads is the equivalent of 10 m ohms. There's your 10 mega ohm impedance meter, uh, the yellow one. Red one's seven, yellow one's 10. All right, let's keep moving. It's gonna play out here for us uh, in a, a few more slides. Uh, voltage output of an ohm meter. This is, so the idea here with the ohm meter is we can actually use the ohm meter if you understand how the tool works. We can use the ohm meter to be uh, a voltage source, a low, low voltage source that we can use for circuit integrity testing. Uh, there's some variables with it. So um, what I'm showing you first is the voltage output of a ohmmeter. And so what I'm doing, this ink shouldn't be here, Caleb. We, we were practicing and, and I had this up here before. Um, but what we want to do is understand that a voltmeter produces voltage. I said voltmeter, same thing I did in practice. That made zero sense at all. Let me state that again. An ohmmeter produces voltage. And this is why when you do uh, resistance measurements, you're always told, make sure there's no voltage in the circuit. Why? Because the ohmmeter is the source when we're doing voltage measurements. It is the source. And it actually puts a small current and voltage on a circuit looks for the voltage drop and measures that drop and equates that to resistance that's how an ohmmeter works so an ohmmeter is a low voltage source and in this one i am measuring the output of my red ohmmeter and i'm showing you the voltage on the yellow meter so the yellow meter is measuring the voltage output of the ohmmeter on the red meter follow that Hope so. All right. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm just simply switching through the range on the red meter and we're going to measure the voltage output from the red meter. And I'm doing that with the yellow. So we're reading 0.44 volts on that one. I scaled it one, uh, one more time. That's K ohm didn't move. Scaled it again. K ohm in each of these, you can see the decimals moving. Okay. I'm just kind of bouncing back and forth between slides. K ohms, the voltage is still 0.44. Um, there's the M ohm scale. The first M ohm scale is 0.4, and then the final M ohm scale is 0.22. So what is the maximum voltage my red ohmmeter puts out? Is 0.44 of a volt. All right, same thing. Let's do the switch the meters. Let's see what the yellow one does. Um, we're now measuring the voltage output of the ohmmeter on the yellow one, okay? We're reading 1.2 volts. Totally different, isn't it? So variables here not everybody's meters are the same 1.2 volts on that one um the k ohm 0.47 all of the k ohm scales there's three of them it's me hitting different buttons stayed at 0.47 and then the m ohm 0.41 and then the uh final uh uh m oh wait what is that oh L. okay that's it would read ol yeah of course and then the final one is actually showing you the the impedance of the uh, red meter, but then you see the voltage output, really our eyes wanted to be not on what's circled, but on that, it's 0.19. We're at 0.4, man, this ink is killing me. 0.41 on that one, 0.19 on that one. Everybody comfortable? Okay, output. Um, the ohm meter is a battery. Next one, again, my ink is here and shouldn't be, apologize. Um, this is the diode scale. We're just measuring the voltage output of the diode scale. The diode scale on the yellow meter, which is where I am now connected, right? I'm, I'm switching that to diodes. And the red meter is reading the voltage output of that. It is two volts. So two volt output on my diode scale. And then um, I'm switching this one. This is now the red one. We are also switched to diode and we're measuring the voltage on the yellow. It's 1.3. So two volt output, diode scale, the yellow one, 1.3 on the red one. We're gonna use this for circuit integrity, okay? Um, some incandescent test light stuff, moving past this quickly, because we're gonna use the test light too. I have substituted, let me, uh, where are we at time-wise? It's 150. When, what's my time frame till 215, I think? Is it till 215? I don't, yes? Uh, we have till two. 30 so you could go a few minutes before that oh i have till 230 230 your time oh sweet okay all right perfect 
then I can slow down a little bit. I'm talking fast. All right. Um, thank you. Um, the uh, baseline testing my, my test lights, and the reason I'm doing this is I have found that you can use the test light instead of a 5,000 ohm resistor. Over the years, I've had people say, well, where do I get a 5,000 ohm resistor? And my answer has always been, well, radio shack. Well, there aren't any radio shacks anymore. They don't exist. So I don't know, Google it. <laughs> uh, the test light is actually your best friend here. Um, uh, it, it's gonna matter what test light. So I wanna be clear here, before you're gonna do anything that I'm teaching in here, you want to baseline test your, your uh, test lights and um, make sure that you're not using something astronomically high amperage, okay? It's really important that you don't because essentially what you're holding in your hand then is a jumper wire. And if you accidentally jump the five volt reference to ground with a jumper wire, what are you gonna do? You're gonna pull the reference voltage to ground. Well, what if we accidentally jump the five volt reference to ground with a test light? What's it gonna do? It's gonna make the test light glow. I know some of you are thinking, well, man, you should never use a test light on a computer controlled circuit. And honestly, I think that's probably been one of the, the biggest misconceptions over the past 30 years um, uh, on cars. Uh, the test light is your best friend if you know how to use it. Yes, there are some safety issues involved, but there are times your test light is your best friend. I could go on and on about that, but I'll, I'll add one more thing. I swear that um, over the years of doing these recordings that maybe some manufacturers watch me because I saw recently a GM flowchart where they told you to take an incandescent test light connected to the 5-volt reference circuit and make sure the test light would glow. It was in the flowchart. I was like, that's awesome. I've never seen a manufacturer flowchart tell me to put a test light on the 5-volt reference circuit. So that's what we're going to do here coming up. We're going to do that. But before we do that, we have to baseline our stuff. Okay. So that's what I'm doing. I just have my amp meter connected using, uh, using the amp port here, right? Set up on an amp scale and I'm measuring the amperage output of my test light. I just put the test light in series. This is with battery voltage and I'm reading 145 milliamps. Okay. 0.145 uh, milliamps for that test light at 12 volts. Same test light engine running, just things to consider as voltage rises, so does current flow. Same test light is now reading 0.166. Okay, so that's my OTC red, <coughs> red light test light. This is an incandescent light. You guys have seen my videos. <clears throat> I have over 900 videos now between my two channels for my website. I have like 430 and YouTube, I have like 500. You'll see this light in probably 75% of them. So it's the light I use all the time. And then I found a little cheap LED test light, which I don't use often, but you're going to see where this, this thing comes in. Um, that uh, the same test amperage output of my LED test light at battery voltage, right? We're at battery volt. I apologize. This ink is messing me up. Uh, 12 volts. I'm reading 0 0.013, so 13 milliamps compared to, uh, say, roughly 150 milliamps. It's a huge difference in current flow, isn't it? And then this one, um, this is uh, with the system running, battery voltage at 15, and you can see the amperage rise up to 19 milliamps. So 19 milliamps from 13 milliamps, still much, much lower amperage than the incandescent is. All right, a little plug for my friends at AES Wave. Um, there, there is a U-Test terminal kit that we're gonna be using here in these next slides. That's where I'm getting them from. Uh, so if you guys are interested in that kit, that would be aeswave.com. And um, they have, uh, um, they, they make this kit. So that's where I got it from. Love my friends at AES. And so they deserve a plug. And so that's for them. All right, let's jump to my truck. <clears throat> And uh, let's take a look at my map sensor. So that's my map sensor and let's unplug it and let's do some circuit identification and some integrity testing. There's my AES leads. Uh, don't take your test light. This is more than just a plug for AES. Don't ever take your test leads or your test light and jam it into the female terminals of a connector, okay? Touching on the tip of it's fine. Don't stuff it in there because when you're done, you're going to have a pin fitment issue that's going to cause separate problems 
that you didn't have before and you're just compounding uh, problems if you do that. So don't ever stuff a pin in that isn't meant for that location, okay? So I'm using these test leads, just quick baseline stuff here. So I want you guys to tell me what kind of circuit is this? There's no problem on this car. Does it have a bias voltage or not? Here's my first measurement. You have five volts on that one, 0 0.013 on that. So zero volts, zero volts on that one. This is a normal circuit. So this 2009 Chevy Silverado, does it have a bias on the map? Yes or no? So this is my reference wire. If this had a bias, what we would see, remember, is five, five, and zero. What do we see? We see yeah. So we see five, zero, and zero. There is no bias here, guys. This is this is a simple potentiometer pressure sensor circuit, no bias. So that little internal resistor does not exist on this design. Okay? So Signal circuit identification isn't really possible here, um, but we can do some integrity testing that will help us with that. Um, but the, the application here though would be, if you're doing this check on the, on the car, you should at this point know what the signal wire is because these two aren't telling me that. I have no idea which one, one of those two is the sensor ground and the other one's the signal wire. And it, it would be at this point that you would want to know your signal wire, okay? And and this would be one that you have a fixed zero, a fixed zero volt signal on the scan tool and with a trouble code. Go down to the sensor and I probably wouldn't unplug it, but I would probably back probe it to do these measurements, but it's just how I'm showing it to you here. And we're gonna actually use our test light and our meter the ohmmeter and diode scales to help us determine circuit integrity. So next, next page really addresses what we said. Um, Here's one question. Yeah. So how do you know which ones have internal resistors? Good question. Uh, you don't. So the, uh, the question Caleb just asked me is how do we know which ones have internal resistors? Um, if you're lucky, a manufacturer wiring diagram will show a little resistor in there and then a positive source. So you can see it sometimes on diagrams. On Mitchell diagrams, the ones I use all the time, they don't give you that information. It's not there. So you have no idea. And the service info doesn't even tell you about it. So how, how are you to find out? You don't know for sure. Um, my suggestion would be to learn your systems and uh, practice, and you're going to learn some common ones like I can tell you for sure that every single Chrysler that I've worked on since 1985 to 2020 um, use a five volt uh, bias on all of their uh, three wire sensors. So that's a Chrysler thing. Um, that's experience that taught me that. So I think for you guys, the important part is know that it's there and know how to work with it and these testing methods I'm going to give you will, will allow you to do these integrity tests, uh, whether it's there or not. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so great question. Um, um, how do we find out uh, which one the signal wire is here without a wiring diagram is where we are. And then how do we do an integrity test? Uh, we, we're going to use our test light. And we're going to jump the 5-volt reference to the signal wire. And I know maybe the owners of Christian Brothers Automotive or maybe their eyes are a little bit big right now. Are you sure you want to be teaching our guys that? Because we might be hurting things. Just I want you guys to know, uh, the managers, the big wigs of the company, um, I'm going to add some current measurements and voltage drops in here with a lab scope coming up. And we're going to be able to see how much current we're actually taking from the 5-volt reference circuit. Okay, So put your minds at ease a little bit and then use the test light I'm using and then you won't have any problems, okay? Um, or, you know, just follow the manufacturer flow chart and, you know, I'll be done with my car and you'll still be on that car. So there's a trade-off. There is a trade-off. You need to know what you're doing, pay attention closely. And the, the methods that I'm teaching, I have never hurt a car, ever, not once, okay? So, yes. We're going to take a test light, an incandescent test light, jump the 5 volt reference to the signal wire. That's what I'm doing. Um, I'm taking the 5 volt ref wire and I'm 
I have my test light and it's just the same as a, as a resistor and notice on my scan tool that I'm reading five volts. So if you had a sensor that was fixed at zero all the time and you unplug it and you jump the five volt reference to the signal wire with, through your test light and notice that we're reading five volts, how is the integrity of the signal wire? There's no reason to disconnect the computer, disconnect the sensor, and ohm the wire for opens and shorts. So what do we have? It's good. What if the wire was shorted to ground? What would happen? What's going to happen? The test light's going to light. It shouldn't light here. Why? Because that internal sensing circuit doesn't support current flow, right? That piece inside. So uh, just to draw that real quick for you guys, you have five volts out. Oh, shoot. That's in the way, huh? Uh, let's draw it up here. How's that? I'll draw it backwards. Nope. All right, I'll draw it like we were. So five volts comes through a fixed resistor. There's our ground. Then, oh shoot, that doesn't belong there yet. This volt voltage sensing circuit, and then we have a resistor. Uh, in here, although on this design, we don't have the resistor, sorry. And we disconnected this guy. We're reading five, zero, and zero. And we're taking our test light and we're going from this guy. There's your little test light in there to this guy. And we're making the scan tool show us five volts. So how is the integrity of the circuit? It is good. What if this wire is shorted to ground? What happens? Five volts goes through the test light and then grounds it the light lights what does your scan tool do remember we are fixed at zero in my example what's the scan tool do it stays at zero what do you have don't put a sensor in it that wire is sorted to ground that's what that means so that's pretty cool um i know you have questions on the regulator we're getting to it that's what we're doing here Fixed at zero. If I jump it, it goes to five. Integrity of the circuit is good. That signal wire is fine. Check your reference. Check your ground. Change the part. Okay? Um, same thing with my LED test light. Different current flow. Yes, Caleb. Uh, someone asked, does the resistance of the test light affect the reading on the scan? Yes, it does. Great question. Perfect timing. Uh, does the resistance of the test light affect the reading on the scan tool? Here it is for you. Here's my LED test light, which we know has about 15 milliamps compared to 150 milliamps of current flow. And we can say with those numbers that the resistance of the LED test light is much, much higher. And in fact, I'm pretty sure that the owners of Christian Brothers Automotive are going to want you guys using the LED test light for this, just because you're going to see how much safer it is. I don't like it because I can't get a full five out of it. As you can see on the scan tool, exactly what your question uh, uh, referred to is this test light only brings the signal voltage up to 2.7 volts, not the full five. But is that enough to tell you that the circuit integrity is good? I think so. Remember where you were. Signal voltage fixed at zero. How is my signal wire? Just before I throw a sensor at this, and I know that nine times out of 10, when you have something like that, uh, it might not be quite that high. Maybe eight times out of 10, eight and a half times out of 10, the sensor's bad. But there's going to be those ones that you get burned by that you shouldn't be getting burned by. That'd be like um, being happy. So think about that. Let's say eight out of 10, you need a sensor, but there's two out of 10 that you don't. Are you guys happy with an 80% when you get an 80% on a written test? You shouldn't be. I'm not. So, I mean, it only takes an extra uh, 30 seconds to do this test and, and, and make sure that the signal circuit is good before you put a component in. That's really what this is about. And I could give you countless, countless case studies where I have opens and shorts and it's not a sensor problem. Uh, one was a, a pin that was bent over backwards on, on in the computer connector. So learn this kind of testing. There you go. Higher resistance test light um, in this circuit. Yeah, definitely affected the voltage, didn't it? There's another one about a low amp fuse lead versus a test light. Uh, low amp fuse lead versus a test light. Let's be clear about signal circuits and input inputs. They run in the micro amp range. So a fuse is not going to help us at all here. It won't. 
You could have the lowest fuse you could find. You're not going to blow a fuse. It's not going to help us protect anything here. And you also want to remember that signal circuits are very, very high impedance, very, very high resistance, and you're not going to hurt them. Uh, in, in my experience, I've even seen uh, a 12-volt heater for an oxygen sensor directly shorted to the signal wire. And you guys know on oxygen sensors, you're talking about a 1-volt circuit, right? Less than 1 volt. I've seen a 12-volt heater wire directly shorted to a 1-volt signal wire. In fact, I have a case study on it. Uh, it was on a Lincoln Navigator, and the scan tool was reading 1,600 millivolts all the time. And uh, it was the heater that was shorted to the signal. And so what are we doing to the signal circuit? We're overloading it. Clearly, we're overloading it with 14, 15 times the amount of voltage that should be there. Guess how the signal circuit was when we were done? As soon as we fixed the wiring and pulled that heater away from the um, uh, signal itself, uh, everything was fine. And so in my experience, you, you don't hurt these voltage sensing circuits with battery voltage. I have seen... Uh, on a Chrysler with a melted harness where the injectors were actually, <coughs> so that was a sensor ground circuit though, that wasn't a sensing circuit, where injector, the voltage spike, the 100 volt spikes from the fuel injectors were getting fed into the sensor ground circuit and ended up cooking the sensor ground circuit, but that's a, that's a different subject. I was thinking the voltage sensing circuit was damaged, but it wasn't. It, it actually cooked the sensor ground circuit. So I guess the short answer is when we're talking about inputs, um, a fuse isn't going to help you and they're super high ohm circuits. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So in this test, I showed you how to do an integrity test using a test light. Which one's safer uh, is up for debate. Uh, I'm going to show you the amperage here in a minute. Um, the LED increased it to two and a half and the uh, incandescent increased it to five. And then what if the signal wire sorted to ground? I addressed that. The light would light. What if I accidentally jumped the sensor 5-volt RAF to ground with the test light? Well, let's do it. It's my truck. If I'm going to ruin something, let's do it. So that's what I'm doing. I'm intentionally jumping the 5-volt reference to the signal wire now. And what do we notice? I'm sorry. I'm intentionally jumping the 5-volt RAF, which I believe is this guy over here, into the sensor ground circuit. Right, this is my signal wire, which we were on before. We are no longer on that. Yeah. Yeah. This is the signal. This is what this is what we were messing with before. Now which one am I messing with? Sensor ground. So I'm intentionally doing something I don't want to do. Because this is what's gonna happen. You're not sure which one the sensor ground is, or maybe you thought you were sure and you touched the wrong wire. Well, that's what I'm doing. What do we notice about my test light? killing me it's lit okay test light lights what about the led same thing all right so if we're going to do that though we should probably make sure that our 5 volt ref circuit's okay um and so that's the question is the 5 volt regulator able to handle the additional load from the test light well, let's look at it i'm now uh, adapting a tool that allows me to measure voltage and jump the circuit and so we're clear on what we're looking at. Um, my red meter is measuring the 5-volt reference circuit, right? This is my 5-volt reference circuit. I'm feeding that 5 volts down into my meter so we can see it before I jump my test light, which I'm about to, into this terminal. And we're going to jump that test light, and that's cooling around. And actually, I'm just going to... I'm not going to the sensor ground, I guess, maybe because it was easier to show in the picture that I'm going to ground. So I'm just intentionally grounding the 5-volt reference circuit, which would be the same thing as you jump in the 5-volt reference to the sensor ground circuit. And here's what we got. Wait. Hold on. The flow of my slides is off here. Okay, yeah. This is the right way to do it. This would be jumping the 5-volt reference to the signal wire and then seeing the scan tool. This is what we're attempting to do, right? And when we do it wrong, it would be like this. Uh, I, oops, wrong pin, right? Here's the right pin, 5-volt reference to the signal. Look at the scan tool, what's it do? Jumps to five, 
Test light's not lit. That's great. What if I jump the 5 volt reference to the signal wire uh, by accident? Um, I, I actually misspoke here two slides back. I got to back up. I had, I was thinking that I was a, my apologies. Some of you are a little bit lost on that comment. Um, I, um, this is just a, a leftover picture is all this is. Okay. That test light being connected to ground has nothing to do with what I'm trying to illustrate here. I'm just getting set up for the measurement. I'm going to jump the signal to ground using the sensor ground in these next captures. My apologies. This is the right way to do it. 5 volt ref to the signal. Signal fixed at zero goes to five. How's the integrity of your circuit? You're fine. Test light does not light. Oops, jumped the wrong wire. That's where we're at now. But look at the 5 volt reference circuit. What did we do? We went from five down to 4.99. Is the 5 volt regulator able to handle this current flow from this test light? This is my incandescent light, the one that draws about 150 milliamps. Notice the light is lit and my reference voltage stays the same. Of course, scan data didn't change. Why did scan data not change? Because I jumped the wrong pin. All right. Or what if the signal wire was shorted to ground? What's it going to look like? Exactly like this. Okay. Let's do the LED now. Same test. Jump in the circuit like we're supposed to. There's a fly that just flew in front of the camera lens. I don't know if you saw it. We're going to zap them. Where are these coming from? I thought there was like two in here. There's like 10. Uh, five volt ref. Proper way to do it. Five volt to the signal wire. And, you know, we see on the scan tool 2.7 volts. Okay. And then this would be doing it incorrectly. Right, 5 volt reference to ground by accident. Notice the LED light is lit. I'm staying at 5 volts. We're drawing less current from that 5 volt ref circuit. But are we safe? We are. Use the test light as your resistor when you're doing this test. <clears throat> Measure your test light current flow first. Do not use a test light that draws 800 milliamps for this kind of testing. I I've only experimented with the 150 amp milliamp test light and i know some of you are also thinking what about the initial inrush of current with a cold filament of an incandescent bulb great question if you're if you were thinking along those lines i've answered that question for you coming up um it's actually after this part so you guys will probably like the diode and the ohmmeter parts where are we at 214 so i have 15 minutes um i'm gonna move through this quick Try to hang with me. I can use my diode scale to do the same thing. Measure your voltage, 500. Zero, zero. Switch your meter to the diode scale. And then go to those two wires that were zero and watch the scan tool. And that's what we're doing here. I'm just taking my diode scale to ground, black lead to ground, red lead to the signal wire. This is my signal wire. And what do we see on the scan tool? Do you guys remember what the output of the diode scale was on my red meter? It was around 1.3 volts, wasn't it? Guess what we see on the scan tool? 1.3 volts. Pretty cool. Using my diode meter uh, as a way to inject voltage. Um, what if you put the diode scale into the ground wire? Are you going to hurt that sensor ground circuit? Um, I don't have time to cover this. I did have some slides and I measured current. There is zero measurable current from one of these diode scales on both of my meters. I could not measure current. And I actually took a little Christmas bulb, an LED Christmas bulb, and I could show that my red meter at 1.3 volts could not light it, but my yellow meter at 2 volts, remember the diode scales, 1.3 on the red meter, 2 volts on the yellow meter, I can make this little LED light light so I could prove there was current flow. And then I put an ammeter in series 0. Point, or 0, 0. 0, 0 amps. Could not measure it. Couldn't measure it. Are you going to hurt? My point is we knew going into this we had 5, 0, and 0. And we had question marks. We didn't know which one of these two was the signal and which one was the ground. Well, switch your meter to diode and touch them both. 
What's the signal wire going to do on the scan tool? This. What's the sensor ground going to do? Nothing. And are you going to hurt it? No. Okay. All right. Diode meat. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Using the diode scale. All right. Here's reverse polarity with the diode scale. Nothing works. So polarity is important. Keep your polarity the same. Here's what you want to remember. Keep your polarity the same for the diode scale as you did for your voltmeter. Then you'll be fine. It's not like that with the ohmmeter though. I had to, to get the ohmmeter, remember the ohmmeter produces voltage, to get the ohmmeter to um, have a signal voltage reaction like you're seeing here at the bottom, and that's me ranging through all the scales, notice I had to have my negative lead connected to the signal and the positive lead connected to a known good ground to be able to do that. And so if, if you're going to use the ohmmeter as a way to inject a signal, you can, but you have to remember that polarity needs to be reversed for what your voltmeter would be. And so that's why I think it's a win again for the diode scale. Um, and this is just no signal. This is just showing you exactly that. No changes, even selecting all the scales with polarity being incorrect. Um, and this is me doing the same thing, diode scale with the yellow meter on the signal wire, um, keeping the same polarity, uh, that same 1.97 or two volt output of the diode scale. I'm seeing that on the scan tool. That's a win. How is my circuit integrity? Number one. Number two, I definitely know which one my signal wire is, don't I? Now, granted, you get this deep into one, you probably have a diagram in front of you, but this is going to help you. This will help you do field work when you don't have a diagram and you have a fault and you're trying to make sure that your wiring is okay before changing that sensor. And sometimes I know some of you have this perspective that you think oh, that sensor is easy to change. It's cheap. It's not always that way. Uh, my engine speed sensors on my RV, for example, it is a 10 hour job to get to the speed sensor, 10 hours to get to them. You have to take the high pressure pump out or the um, underneath that you can maybe get to it in a couple hours, taking out the air pump and the um, hydraulic pump. Can't get to them. You're going to throw a part at a car. Or you're going to do some integrity testing. I can get to the connector, but I can't change the sensor. Let's do some integrity testing. Let's save ourselves and the customer some money. Using the diode scale reverse polarity, uh, no signal change on the scan tool. Uh, with the polarity being incorrect. So you want to remember that. Again, the ohm scale with the yellow meter, what was the max of the ohm scale was 1.2 on this, and it was 0.44 on the red meter. So different meter, different scaling. Don't forget, if you're going to use your ohm meter to do this, switch your scales, okay? All right, we got 10 minutes. Time flies. Let's look at... Um, oh, this is... Yeah, I'm going to skip this. Using my body as a variable resistor. I'm just touching uh, batter, back post of the alternator and my finger on the signal wire. Yes, I'm injecting higher voltage than what should be there. But remember my O2 heater circuit example? That signal circuit's fine. Using my body to be the resistor. That's pretty cool. And then your codes, you can, you know, that's there just to remember. You can do opposite codes. Um, if it's high, force it low. If it's low, force it high. I'm going to skip the AC pressure sensor. I want to come down to, um, hang on. Let's see where I'm at here. Someone asked, is any of this stuff in your ebook? Uh, yes. Uh, the question was, is any of this stuff in my ebook? Yes, I've been referencing. Uh, chapter 7 is where I'm getting the drawings from, potentiometers. Chapter 10 is signal circuit integrity that I blew past earlier. And then this updated version with these examples, um, you'll find on the premium channel, not in the book, uh, but we're using the book kind of as a guide and we're kind of jumping off from that point and doing doing these lectures. So we, we are running out of time. Um, I need to move fast through this Jeep. I want to show you guys uh, a difference here. Um, this is a new car. This is a 96 Jeep. We'll go after the map sensor. Normal key on engine off voltage, the bottom left of the screen. Let's unplug it. What do we know right away? So map sensor plugged in, normal reading on the scan tool, 4.4. Unplug it. What do we have? We got five volts on the scanner. What design is this? Yes, this is a biased design. This is different than what we were just working on. 
So what I just covered with you guys previous is how to manipulate, how to work with non-biased circuits. Here's a biased one, right? This is absolutely the bottom picture in this example, no question. Without a wiring diagram, can we identify which one the signal is? Remember what we said, with a bias circuit, we're gonna see, we're gonna see five, five, and zero. Not five, zero, and zero like the last one. So without a diagram, let's look at them. All three pins, zero volts, 5.14, 5.15. So there's our five, five, and zero. Everybody follow that? Now, if you're looking close, you're looking close, there's a difference. What is this difference? One's reading 5.15, one's reading 5.14. Now, that's why I brought in the meters and their resistance, because a meter, a voltmeter, has a path to ground. It's very high ohms, but you will steal some amount of voltage to any circuit you're attached to. It doesn't have to be much. But what's this tell me? This 5.15 is my reference. This 5.14 is my signal. How do I know that? Because when I put my meter on this signal, it's basically this meter to ground voltmeter has 10 M ohms. But is this a path? Is there now some small trickle of current through my meter? Yes. So this one was 5.15, and this one with my meter connected dropped to 5.14. That's my signal circuit. Pay attention to little things, tells you lots of things. All right, so back to the signal wire. And I wanna uh, tell you when I was looking at this live, look at it, it was bouncing, right? 5.14, 5.15, that's my signal circuit. Uh, question to you guys, what would a meter with less resistance, lower impedance do? What would it look like? What do you think? Sorry, I don't have time to wait for replies. We got seven minutes here. Um, remember my red meter was seven mega ohms. The yellow meter was 10. We just saw what the 10 mega ohm meter did. What did it do? Dropped it to 5.14. Well, here's the, um, that's the reference. Here's the signal. There's the red meter, same car. 5.12. Why is that one less? Because the red meter has less resistance and we're stealing more current from the circuit. That's my signal wires. The point. How cool is that though? Huh? Uh, remember some of your lab scopes will have like two mega ohm. I, my original Pico, I don't know about the 4425, but the original one, uh, 4423, I believe had 2 million ohms. And so when I was teaching bias voltage to my class, I was surprised at how low the bias was that I was seeing, and I didn't realize it was because my scope has much less resistance than the um, uh, multimeter. Oh, and you guys that like to use power probes, that's where the power probe is going to get you in trouble because its internal impedance is in the is in the hundred thousand ohms, not the mega ohms. You will take any bias voltage with a power probe, and it'll pull it straight to ground. So remember that, even on your voltage scales, before you hit any of those buttons, that thing's got real low resistance. And when you wanna do bias voltage testing, the power probe's not the tool you wanna to use, not even the one with the voltmeter uh, uh, on it. Um, scan tool, uh, this is easy. When you have a bias, it's super easy. If you have a car that's fixed at zero volts, picture it, what do you do? Go to the sensor, unplug it. What should it do? It should go to five, right? Just what we did with Tommy's uh, Volkswagen or that car he was working on, right? That five volt, use it to your advantage. Unplug the sensor. What should the scan tool show you? If the scan tool was at zero and it jumps up to five when you unplug the sensor, what's wrong? You're done. Sensor shorted. It's not going to be a reference problem and it's not going to be a ground problem. What's a ground problem going to do? A ground problem is going to leave you at five all the time, not zero all the time. So nice, quick and easy test. If you know that bias is there. Um, what am I doing here? Oh, this would be a case where you have a fixed five volts on the scan tool and you wanna make sure that your integrity is fine. Uh, you can certainly just do a measurement down at the sensor, but you can also pull it to ground with your test light, which is what I'm doing, pulling it down to zero with my test light, right? There we go. All right, I got it. I have to jump ahead because I told you guys I was going to give you amperage measurements. I want to do that. 
This is really important, especially if I'm teaching you this. I want um, to be clear about what we're looking at. So I'm using a Pico amp probe and I'm doing a baseline test on my test light and I'm zero, uh, that's just me zeroing the probe. This is a battery test. And again, this is a battery test. I'm looking at the inrush of current, incandescent bulb, inrush of current. And I'm reading, this This made me, made my eyes kind of open a little bit wider thinking, yeah, maybe I should be a little bit more careful about using my test light for this. Uh, my initial inrush of current is 1.1 amps. What is my nominal? It's 145 milliamps on this test light, 150 milliamps. But initial inrush, 1.15. And this is a real small time frame. This is 10 seconds. This is 12. So that's a two second window right there. That is a very, very small time frame of that high of amperage. Um, this is the LED. Sorry, this is the same incandescent light between the reference wire and ground. So intentionally shorting it. Let's see how much current flow we're putting on this regulator. Initial inrush of current. Initial inrush of current. We're looking at a 151 milliamp surge. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Did I, I, did I just say 151? Like it's 451. My apologies. In my experience from working with 5 volt regulators, they can handle uh, somewhere around an amp. So at least the ones you buy from Radio Shack, they can handle an amp of current flow. The ones in cars are highly protected. I believe they use PTC resistors that are in series to the regulator that help reduce current flow when there's a short. This is much lower than um, that one amp I'm talking about. I'm comfortable, guys, with my incandescent bulb light 5 volt reference to ground. What am I do How much am I pulling? How much current flow? It's right there. 451 milliamps initial and then 58 milliamps after to keep the bulb lit. And then of course the LED is going to be um, a lot uh, better. That's me using my fingers. Just manipulate. Did I skip the LED? Where's my LED one in here? Well, I, I don't I'm, I, we're out of time. Um, it's in here, but uh, the LED one, of course, I showed you guys doing this kind of testing would be would be safer. But I'm I'm comfortable giving these numbers, in particular that one, um, teaching you what I'm telling you. And, and obviously, we don't want to jump the five volt reference to ground. But if you did by accident, or if the signal circuit was shorted, is my red bulb light okay with doing this kind of testing? The answer is yes. Uh, there's a whole lot more. I think I had, I don't know, I have probably a hundred more slides. And, and again, to remind you guys, you can see the rest of this lecture. It might be a little bit different style, but um, pretty pretty close. What's that? You guys said give you a minute, so there's your minute. Yep, we got it. Hey, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you, Caleb. Uh, awesome session. I know I got a lot out of that. I hope everybody else did. Uh, I put a link up there, which I know they already put earlier, but y'all check it out. Scannerdanner.com. Uh, awesome website. Tons of information. Um, also, we're giving away. Uh, thank you, Paul. We're giving away a couple of the premium memberships there. That'll come out with the raffle through MTD here in a little while. Uh, so we got one less than a minute. Uh, we're going to jump over to the next uh, Zoom meeting going to be auto tech tips. So let me post that up. So there's our next session. If everybody will jump over there, and thank we have you guys. Minutes to go through tech tips. Thank you again, Paul. Thank you, Caleb.